Hello, welcome to Stories in Focus. My name is Eloise Schottler. I'm your host and a storyteller. But today we've got something really special. Anybody that's been to see the show before knows that means there's a guest here outside of the camera. Jane Dorfman, Montgomery County storyteller and librarian for a long time, has brought us a wonderful experience that she just had. You had an adventure in Central Park, I'm, New I'm, York City, didn't you? New York you? City, yeah, not a place I've been very much at all. No. I was lucky enough to get to be to get be asked to come and tell at the Hans Christian Andersen statue. Tell us what that means. There be many people that are watching that well, don't know what that means. In Central Park, there is this larger than life size statue of Hans Christian Andersen. He has a book on his lap, and there is um, the Swan, the Ugly Duckling, one of his most famous stories, and also the most autobiographical, sitting there at his feet. And there's been storytelling in that statue for the past 62 years every Saturday from June to September. And this was the first time I've told there, and I really hope it's not the last. It was just wonderful. Uh, what was wonderful about it? You know, it's, it's sort of a thing for storytellers. There's a long history. Lots of people that I knew and know still have told there. It was just really something. The Park Service comes, they set up some chairs. It wasn't a huge audience. It was really, really hot. But that was better than rain because all, all up the days, you know, to get there, it would have been 40 percent, 50 percent, dropping down to 30 percent, and then it was perfectly dry. Right. Except if you breathed in the air, it was very humid. So going to Central Park to tell with the statue, mm -hmm. Hans Christian Andersen, a figure in storytelling, when did he start? writing or pr publishing his work. Here. I don't know the dates. Back in the 1800s. Uh, yeah. And he has uh, he had sort of a sad life. He always wanted to be better and more famous. He was in love with various beautiful women. He was a very homely man. He was in love with various beautiful women, dancers, all of whom rejected him. Um, but he wrote these wonderful stories and, you know, that children just loved and families and uh, they're just so inventive. And a lot of them are really sad. Some of them I would never tell. The poor little match girl. The steadfast tin so soldier. Oh, that's oh, a hard Those are all sad, sad stories with him. But he dies at the end. Yeah. I remember watching the tin soldier. There's a small mm -hmm. video or movie of it uh, with my oldest grandchild. Juliana was about two, three years old mm -hmm. when we saw this. And and she just started crying, and she said, it's so sad, it's so sad, it's so sad. So even young children Yeah, but it's wonderful she would. As kids, a kids sad need story. that emotion, you know. It's wonderful mm -hmm. she was sensitive enough to uh, mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. for this little lead soldier melted away. Yeah. Tell yeah. me, uh, now, we probably should say uh, something about the fact that even though to people in, like us, we're in storytelling, are familiar with Hans Christian mm -hmm. Andersen. Many people don't know who he is. Yeah, they probably know the names of the stories. You right. know, he's from Denmark. He is incredibly famous there. He, Disney has co-opted many of his stories, like The Little Mermaid, yeah. um, and sweetened up the ending of that one. But uh, he is uh, known worldwide. His, he's, was as, in his time, he was as famous as Charles Dickens. And when he would come to a country, it was just people came out to see him and hear him. So he did get that fame he really desired before he died. Um, he has a lot of uh, stories about inanimate objects, like the thimbles and the needle. He has some, not too many with actual children in it, but What's a lot of animal favorite? stories. What's your favorite? Unfortunately, I like the poor little match girl, <laughs> which is a very sad story. And I love the ugly duckling. Now, at this statue, you don't have to tell his stories. In fact, I don't think very many people do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't tell them, and I wasn't asked to tell them. Uh, you know, I did kind of a literary story from Eleanor Farjan, who is another forgotten writer of um, fairy tales. Uh, I was telling with Laura Sims, who's a wonderful teller from New York. And right. She's actually the one who runs this now and schedules the tellers. And she told a couple of folk tales and then generously gave me the bulk of the time, which was really nice. Who funds this? There is a Hans Christian Andersen Center. Mm -hmm. They do ask for donations, but I think they don't get, you know, they like sort of have a hat out to put money in, and some people did, but they're not going to fund the website and all this. Uh, the park must, uh, they sponsor 
it to a certain extent because they put up chairs, they have the sound system, they have their staff coming to take up and down the chairs and sit and listen, which was kind of nice to see them, these guys sitting there waiting. Uh, so this, it's probably Central Park has some other funding. Yeah, but there is, a Hans, there is a Hans Christian Andersen Center, Storytelling Center, and they have a website that has a list of all the um, upcoming tellers and who's told and different things about, you know, of course, places to make donations. Right. The thing that we should mention here at this point is that for her career in librarian, as a librarian, uh, Jane's is a children's librarian. Mm -hmm. So I was. Really Recently retired. Re your business to know these stories yeah. and to pick them and to choose. For mm -hmm. How do you choose for the audience? For the audience. Um, you need a fairly good uh, repertoire to do that. Like I went with a story that was the one I was going to tell that was advertised a story I just love called Tom Cobble and Uni, which I did tell, but it was frankly a little old for who was sitting there. Mm -hmm. So then I had to bring up some other stories um, that would be better for those kids. You know, that it's advertised as children six and up, but people see storytelling and they bring their babies in the strollers. And just because they're too young for the advertised age, you can't ignore them. You want them to enjoy it and, yeah, and yeah, listen. Yeah. So uh, you have to kind of do it a little bit on the fly and say, oh, well, this, I have this one if they're young. And yeah, that's the one I brought out. But now, as a librarian, you never knew exactly who was going to be in your audience in the library. In the library, I have mm -hmm. a lot more control over the age. Do you really? How, yeah. how so? I can say this one is for infants up to 24 months. Mm -hmm. And then this one is for 24 months up to five or six. But you don't get those older kids anymore. They're all in preschool. Mm -hmm. So you have a little bit of control over that. Now, I don't go as far as some librarians who almost said, show me your birth certificate. <laughs> You're not three yet. Um, but, funny, uh, funny. Yes. Uh, but you, you have a little control over that. But you just have to be prepared for who is there. Well, I was telling Jane just recently that I met a physical therapist who heard my voice and questioned me as to whether I was a storyteller well, because she said neat? she remembered mm -hmm. my voice at Glen Echo, which was quite a few years back. Must have been at five the, at the folk festival. Yeah, yeah at the folk festival, long. which is a production that Jane supervises and brings around I, every I schedule year. schedule that storytelling stage. I mean, there's dance and music, and yeah. I have a little tiny, minute input with that, but mostly it's But the it's thing I was so impressed by is that this was an adult listener who was bringing her children there, mm -hmm. and she remembered all of the stories and talked uh, quite a lot about her love of storytelling. I hope you got her name. That is really yes, a prize I, listener. I know. <laughs> well, I have it, but I can't give it out over the TV. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that just, I, I called Jane and told her that I had met this woman and that it was so interesting and it was wonderful for me to get that kind of feedback oh, that yeah. the woman remembered yeah. my voice. Right. So I think that that's another gift from storytelling that, people don't talk about too much, mm -hmm. that the, the, the story's resonance in a kid's but, yeah, ear. They or, resonate and the voice resonates. And it's, it's a part of our, our brain I think we don't use enough, those, the sound things. Oh, I know that. I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brings it up like that. It's wonderful when somebody remembers your stories. Yeah. It really is. So how long have you been doing the work out at Glen Echo? Oh, at least 15, 16 years. A long time. And it's a lot of work, too. Yeah, some, some years more than others, but um, this last year was pretty calm. People stayed where they belong. They didn't, uh, nobody stood me up. It was good, yeah. So this is actually the Folklore Society. Mm -hmm. Folklore Society puts on the folk, the Washington Folk Festival, and they've done that every year. This was 37, I think, 37th year. And it's always at Glen Echo. It's the first full weekend after Memorial Day, and about 10,000 people come. Wow. The rain this year, which does cut into the attendance a little bit, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's a great event. Well, I saw Jane before she went to Central Park, mm -hmm. and she was quietly excited, but now you're obviously more excited yeah, that, about it was really having a great been day. there. It was just wonderful. Yeah, you know? yeah. The park is beautiful. I I'd maybe looked at it once from the outside. I've never walked around in it. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. It's this big open green space and it's used and everybody is there. I saw the boat pond where Stuart Little had sailed his little sailboat. <laughs> that was great. Um, so yeah, it was really, it was a nice event. Oh. I didn't get lost. I, my trains came on time. You know, my connections were. How did you go? I went up by train and mm -hmm. I stayed with a cousin in Connecticut and then we went in early. 
in the morning and came in at Grand Central Station and then went to the park. I just saw a picture of Grand Central this morning. Mm -hmm. It was a, a one of the, the news channel mm -hmm. uh, cable stations is using it now as an opening, you know, mm -hmm. and I hadn't been in, in that station okay. in a Thank long you, time. Thank you, Jackie it, Kennedy. It would have it's, all been it's, torn it's still down. Is gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And it would have been rubble. She, they wanted to tear it down. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very pretty. <clears throat> and I found, <clears throat> excuse me, New York safe. The people were very friendly. I mean, uh, you know, my cousin goes and talks to everybody, but um, we got directions from umpteen people, and they all went out of their way to uh, mm -hmm. make sure we were going the right direction. So that was very nice. What's the most startling memory from this trip? From that trip, I think just going up to the statue and said, here I am. I'm gonna, not exactly going to sit on your lap, hands, but I'm going to stand right here <laughs> and tell these stories. <laughs> just like, you know, this, all these people behind you who have done it before. Mm -hmm. And that was, it's kind of a, a little bit of taking, taking a little step onto some historical timeline. Who would be on the neat. list for tellers up there? Let's see. Let's see. Well, this year we had Jackson Gill, and we would have had Laura Bobro, but she had a broken hip, and so she didn't get to go. Panina Schramm, who is a famous uh, Jewish storyteller, that she's performed here. Uh, just lots and lots of people whose names you know and who you've heard of, you know. Um, it was really, this resurgence was done by Diane Wolkstein, and I had spoken to her years ago at one of the storytelling conferences. Unfortunately, that was her last one. She went to someplace like China and died there. I remember. And they were really young. She was a great force in storytelling, and so I think she sort of revamped this. It had never stopped, but it was when she was doing the scheduling that you started to hear about it again. She was a very dynamic. I did meet her mm -hmm. in Nova Scotia, uh, yeah. uh, storytelling on women. This was 1999 or something yeah. of that nature. Yeah. And she was a very dominant, very dynamic yeah, woman in person. the group. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she was one of the few, one of the original people who went to collect stories. And when they collected them, well, she, Haiti was the place she went most. She did it not in dialect, but she used some of their words. She had the pictures of the person who told the tour. She had their name. And so often collectors just kind of grab the story and run. Am I remembering and, correctly that she is known for a very famous uh, story? Uh, is it the oranges? Or? The, the magic orange tree. The That's the name of the book, tree. and it's a title story. She also has some really old stories, like pre, way before the Egyptians, about the goddess Inanna. And those are also famous of hers. You know, that she has, I don't know where she got those stories, but she, those were kind of also signature stories. That's a clue for anybody that's listening to seeing this program, you know, uh, to what jo Jane is really sharing is the, what the librarian in the children's room knows that we don't. Yeah, it can direct you. And no, yeah. you're not going to find Anderson in the folk tales. You're going to find him in the fiction because he wrote those stories himself. So don't look for him in the 398.2s. Right, the, the, those are literary stories. Yeah, because the, the uh, folk tales actually have just been spun on down, mm -hmm. changed, and, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. So please stay where you are because we're going to be back in just a few minutes, and Jane's going to share with us a few of the stories that she told in Central Park this past weekend. Sweetheart, think about your future. Jeff over there did, and just look at him. He saved up, bought a house, he's got a beautiful wife, they even had a fancy pants destination wedding, and oh, oh, they had a baby! Ah! Smart and handsome, ooh, la la. Ah. Now, I've been saving these frames for pictures of my future grandbabies for years, and the shopping sprees on organic clothing and eye telephone cases is not helping you save for a family. Oh, gracious! Look at that! He's a model! <gasps> I bet you he's putting all that money right into a 401k or his baby's college fund. And his teeth are so straight. See how good saving can look at feedthepig.org. Feed the pig. Well, today I'm going to tell you two of the stories that I told in Central Park. One of them was too long and also a little old for my audience, and it's, though it's a story I love. But this one is called Joseph the Tailor. And I start out by saying there are two kinds of people. There are the ones who save everything, and there are ones who throw everything away. 
And if one marries one, it's pretty good. If two savers like my husband and I marry, oh, it's just a mess. But this is about a tailor and his wife. And he was a saver, and she, as you will see, is a thrower away. A long time ago, before there were sewing machines, before there were department stores, people sewed their clothes by hand. They would stitch and sew, they would cut and snip and make whatever you needed to have. Now Joseph the tailor had a coat, a long coat that he just loved. But for whatever reason, his wife Sarah, oh, she hated it. And one day his coat was all ragged around the bottom and he said, oh, Sarah, look at my beautiful coat, it's ruined. And his wife said, throw it away. But, 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 I'm a tailor. So he cut and he snipped and he stitched and he sewed and he made himself a jacket. Oh, and Joseph loved that jacket and he wore it every day. But after a while, there were big holes in the elbows and he said, oh, Sarah, look, my beautiful jacket, it's ruined. And you know what the wife said, throw it away, but I'm a tailor. So he cut the sleeves off, he cut and he snipped and he cut two points in the front and he made himself a vest. And Joseph loved that vest, and he wore it every day. But his wife, oh, she hated it. Now, Joseph was not the world's neatest eater. There was a little soup down one side, and there was a little wine down the other. And he said, oh, Sarah, look at my beautiful vest. It's ruined. Throw it away, said Sir. No, said Joseph, I'm a tailor. And he got out his scissors and he cut and he snipped and he stitched and he sewed and he cut and there was enough fabric left to make a tie. And he put that tie under his shirt collar and he snugged it up to his neck. And Joseph loved that tie and he wore it every day. But then I tell you, he was not the world's neatest eater. The end of it went in the porridge, and there was some spaghetti sauce, and one day he held it up, he said, oh, look at my beautiful tie, it's ruined. And his wife said, throw it away. But I'm a tailor, said Joseph. And he looked at that tie, and there was enough fabric to make a handkerchief. And when I tell this story to children, I have to tell them what a handkerchief is. It's a little piece of fabric you stitch up the edges. You blot your head when you're hot. When you have a cold, you <laughs> blow your nose. Then you fold it up and put it in your pocket. Joseph made a handkerchief, and he loved that handkerchief, and he wore it every day. And when he was hot and sweaty, oh, he mopped his brow. And when he had a cold, well, <laughs> he blew his nose on it. And after a while, he went, ooh. Look at my beautiful handkerchief, it's ruined. And his wife said, throw it away. Oh, but I'm a tailor. And there was just enough fabric left to cover a button. And this was in the old days. And men wore suspenders, and they buttoned them on to the waistband of their pants. And Joseph put the button right there. And every day he would button his suspenders to it. And Joseph loved that button. But did his wife like it? Even a button? Oh, no, she hated it. And one day when he went to get dressed, his button was gone. And he couldn't find it anywhere. And he said, oh, Sarah, my beautiful button is gone. And his wife said, oh, happy day, because you can't make something from nothing. Oh, said Joseph, I don't know. I think there is just enough left here to make a story. And that's the story you just heard of Joseph the tailor. So that's one of my favorites to tell. And I think it's good for little children and I think it's good for family members because everybody has somebody who's a thrower away and somebody who's a saver. When I was telling in Central Park, it happily did not rain, but it was so hot. It was so humid. You could feel the air as you breathed in. And it reminded me of New Orleans, which is where I grew up. So I told them a family story. This was a long time ago when my mother was a child. There had been a big hurricane, not as big as Katrina, but big enough to take Lake Pontchartrain and send it over the levees and into the neighborhoods. Now the older houses in New Orleans are not flat on the ground. You go up four, maybe five steps to get to the front door. And my grandparents' house was one built like that. So they were in a sea of murky, creamy, brown water but there was no water in the house. My grandmother was a very small woman, very pretty, and she always got her way. And she decided that her husband needed to walk around the outside of the house 
and check for damages. Now, even when I was a child and I heard this story, what was he going to do if he did find any damages? But that's not part of the story. So he took off his shoes and his socks. He didn't even bother to roll up his pants because the water was over his knees. And my mother and her mother watched first from the front door as he went down the steps and into this dark water, out to the sidewalk, around the driveway, all underwater, and they followed him from window to window as to watch his progress. But when he got past the big cypress tree and to the back gate, he just froze because he could feel that under his two bare feet, he had stepped on a snake. And he couldn't see where the head was or the tail was. He was afraid to move. He didn't know what to do. But he noticed that over against the garage, someone had left a shovel standing up. And if he stretched way over, and keeping himself as still as he could, he could just get his hand around that shovel. And he picked up the shovel, and he began to chop wildly all around his feet. And slowly, slowly, pieces of the green garden hose floated to the surface of the water. And in my family, that story is called The Time Your Grandfather Killed the 25-Foot Snake. And he got teased about it the rest of his life, but he was always a good sport. And I don't think he'd mind me telling you. Thank you. I'm one on Monkey Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning is 1 in 750,000. Please fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash? 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. Well, how did you like being in Central Park, New York City, <laughs> with Jane Dorfman? The big city, yeah. Telling her stories. Oh. Yeah, I had such a good time doing that. I had some really good listeners, a few dogs who listened really well. Um, yeah, right. Some ducks from the pond. Yeah. Are the pond is the pond close by? The pond is right, yeah, a few steps. Yeah, but there's, there's the boathouse, there's the pond where Stuart Little sailed his little sailboat, and then there's a path, and then beyond that path is this great big bronze statue of Hans Christian Andersen. Wow. Yeah. So he did achieve the fame that he, he did, wanted. He did, yeah. It's a, I, Hope he appreciates it somewhere. Cause he, yeah, well, that's good. I mean, uh -huh. there yeah. must be many more of these hand Christian Andersen statues. Yeah, I'm sure it's in, in Denmark. Yeah. National treasure in Denmark. Yeah. On the on, on his 150th birthday, they had a huge party there, and you know that uh, that cake show, Cake Boss. They made this enormous cake for Hans, and had all the kids come and eat this wonderful cake. That would, have been, that would have been a fun event. And I think the Queen of Denmark came and read a, she read a story. She didn't tell a story, mm -hmm. but the, we'll let her read it. Well, she is a queen. And she is all. a queen, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so they, they make a big deal of it. Well, I was visualizing in my imagination, you know, being in Central Park, you know, the green that you described mm -hmm. and the bigness of it. You know, so it's a wonderful place to bring children to introduce them to stories the like stories, this. Stories, yeah, yeah. Outside, yeah. and when they can, with their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we just talked about a few minutes ago, adults are out there too. So there were a lot, there were a lot of adults. There were some bike riders. There was some a lot of. There's a lot of foreign tourists. You know. Who, Come through. I know that they all stayed and sat, but there's a little. You know how the tour group leads them with a little umbrella mm -hmm, over there. They mm -hmm. they stayed for a minute there in the back. Uh, so people come to Central Park. You know they're going to see all these uh, places where movies were filmed. Like I went, oh, I know that bridge. Oh yes, I saw that. Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that in a film yeah, or two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was that was really. They're fun still too. still doing that on the Hallmark yeah. station. Yeah. <laughs> it's all those Hallmark. Remember, there movies. was a wedding going on. Uh huh. Um, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh, you could see all these very sparkly people kind of, it was a lot of mud because they had had a lot of flooding in the park with the last big couple rains. So these people in their high heels were kind of 
picking up their skirts and going through the mud. That's I also fun. enjoyed your description of the houses in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they reminded me very much of uh, beach houses that I knew on the shores mm -hmm. of North Carolina, sure, for the Atlantic. Same and for the same reason, they were up on stilts, mm -hmm. and we played underneath. In yeah, the these weren't sandy quite as you could crawl underneath, but they weren't really that high. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. But you can get the picture, mm -hmm. you get the picture. of your yeah. grandfather down there, you know, killing the hose. Killing the hose, <laughs> really, really yeah. fun, really yeah. fun, really fun. There was when they uh, there was a house that had ceiling uh, fan up in the ceiling, like a whole house fan, mm -hmm. and when they opened that up in the. Uh, in the next summer, snake skins fell down, that there had been snakes in the attic long enough to shed their skins. And that's a creepy thought. <laughs> it's a very creepy thought. In fact, I saw a picture on Facebook the other day that somebody took where there was the body of a snake hanging down through the tiles of the roof mm. in the, over this room, and then it squid back up. Oh, and right. I thought, let me I don't think we. I don't think we saw, my family saw, I wasn't born then, but I don't think they saw them alive. They just knew they had they been. They just knew that they had the been there. Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. You know. so that was a long time. That was so far back. I've tried to look. I wanted the name of the hurricane, but it was too far back. It was before they started. Well, I was going to say, you know, yeah. that uh, we experienced some hurricanes in the 40s at Wrightsville Beach, North mm -hmm. Carolina, and that was before it was 44, 45. They weren't named. They were, there was no names. Yeah. yeah. So. It's because they had no television. That's true. There was no, no, true. no, and no, no uh, tracking by radar. No, that's exactly. So yeah. they couldn't identify them, and they didn't right. name them. Uh, a lot is lost mm -hmm. to the history of it. Jane, I can't thank you enough for coming. Oh, That's I really, really it. wonderful. It, just, uh, you know? I, it just kind of caps off a really good weekend to come yeah. here and get to relive it again. With yeah, you. to yeah, share nice. share with us yeah. a little, you know, a big audience, I mm -hmm. hope. And uh, so you'll watch here, watch for Jane Dorfman and mm -hmm. come out to Glen Echo next June. Next June. Mm -hmm. Next June for the see what stories she collects, what storytellers she collects out there. Yeah. And uh, thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Thank okay. you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Please come back. Mm -hmm.